Well, regenerative. Let me just say I am greatly honored to be able to have Alex Zavorankov on the call today to uh, discuss uh, his work and his recent book. Um, Alex holds several, deg several degrees, including a PhD, and is a director and trustee of the Biogerontology Research Foundation, uh, which is a think tank supporting aging research worldwide. He heads a laboratory of bioinformatics at the Clinical Research Center for Pediatric Hematology, Oncology, and Immunology, and is involved in the World Federation for Regenerative Medicine and the European Federation for Regenerative Medicine. Welcome, Alex. Pleasure to be here, Michael. And uh, I uh, read your very relevant blog, lots of fresh ideas. Pleasure to be here again. Great. Yeah, I mean, my, my uh, thrust is more on the personal lifestyle and financial implications. Your work in this is, is very relevant in that it really lays out uh, the, uh, the background of how uh, uh, anti-aging and, and healthy life extension can have dramatic impacts on, on uh, the global economy and society altogether. So thanks again for doing this re uh, interview. And uh, uh, let me just say a few more introductory words. Um, I know you've written this bo a book called The Ageless Generation, How Advances in Biomedicine Will Transform the Global Economy. And it was just published in June of 2013. Um, th this book, as I mentioned, was incredibly relevant, and, I, and that's why I've tracked you down to be able to ask you a few more uh, questions and get your perspective. Uh, but let me, let me read this introduction of your book that I found, uh, it was on uh, the uh, Amazon uh, site, uh, it was, uh, and it was an introduction by Abba de Grey, uh, who I know is your friend and somebody that I've written about and talked and met myself uh, many times. And here's what Aubrey says about your book. It says, uh, quote, the devastating impact of population aging in the decades to come is becoming like the proverbial weather. Everyone is talking about it, but no one is doing anything about it. Zavarankov starkly sets out the nature and trajectory of this crisis, and then he elaborates what few others have yet described, and no one so expertly, the unique solution to it, namely the development of a comprehensive rejuvenation medicine that will restore and maintain the health of the elderly so that they continue to contribute wealth to society. This book has the potential to define the medium-term economic and social policy for the entire industrialized world, unquote. So that, that's from Abbe de Grey, the uh, chief science officer at the SENS Foundation. That's an incredible vote of confidence, don't you think, uh, Alex? Uh, absolutely. Well, Aubrey is one of the very few visionaries in this world who suggested the first comprehensive model to um, combat aging. And uh, I respect his opinion uh, immensely. Yeah. <clears throat> well, let me just dive into the meat of your book. And uh, maybe I, what, I, what I thought might be helpful would be to just, uh, if I could just read the headlines of the chapters so that people get a, an idea of the flow of what you've covered. And then I'll go back and ask some questions about, uh, about the various chapters, if that's okay. Perfect. So, uh, uh, you know, your, your introduction is phenomenal, but, but when you get into the part one, which is called the era of longer lifespans, is where you really uh, uh, give us the, the whole kind of picture of where we're heading uh, in terms of life expectancy. Uh, you, and you get into the, uh, talking about a tipping point, you get into the demographics of major uh, countries and how uh, each country is a little bit different, but essentially we're in a global, global aging world. And then you get into uh, uh, part two, where you really dive into uh, aging itself and the process of aging and, and what, what aging really entails, looking at the biology of that, uh, and basically uh, looking at a lot of the uh, current thinking and theories about aging, and then also get into the idea of repairing, uh, possibility of repairing damage, uh, and uh, the whole idea of regenerative medicine and, and biogerontology, which really brings up the whole notion of people living uh, longer and healthier uh, lives. Uh, and that, that, that whole chapter is really quite uh, in-depth and really excellent. I mean, I've read, you know, there's, I've been reading this topic for a long time, but I have to say that was just an excellent uh, overview and in-depth 
uh, you know, uh, dive into this whole area. The part three of the book is called The Need to Reform Medical Research. And uh, I really hope you will talk a bit more about that. To me, it seems like a real key uh, part of uh, making this really uh, become a real reality, which is uh, uh, to move uh, the actual uh, anti-aging research along. We really need to look at reforming how it's done right now. And then in your part four, you get into the retirement culture and uh, how that how this will change uh, uh, as as uh, people start living longer, uh, what this means to society, what it means to people. And I and I hope then to ask you particularly what what should people do, you know, as a result of this kind of vision that you're laying out? uh, What what should the individual who's thinking about their own? Uh, retirement and uh, their own financial security, uh, given the and given the uncertain nature of uh, of, of medicine and uh, uh, health costs, what should they do now? So, so that will be you know we'll get to that down the road. So, so let me jump back now into part one, which is the era of life of longer lifespans. And, uh, and there you you presented the notion that we're approaching a tipping point in in respect actually a couple different tipping points but one in, in respect of how the aging population will strain the financial system that we have can can you uh, describe this tipping point a bit further well i think it's pretty obvious that uh, in, in many countries the dependency ratio that is the ratio of um, the retired population to uh, the working population is increasing steadily, especially that's visible in the U.S. where, well, first of all, the statistics are transparent and uh, uh, we have a baby boomer population that's been uh, tracked uh, from all angles uh, and we can see how uh, the retirement of that population group is going to affect the economy. I'm definitely not the first uh, um person to raise the leg, uh, red flag, and there have been uh, many economists, uh, a multitude, uh, who are pointing to aging as one of the major sources of uh, economic problems down the road. Uh, one of the most vocal and uh, most prominent scientists uh, in the field of economics uh, who actually raised this issue um, is Lauren Kotlikoff. Uh, at um, Harvard uh, and uh, a few others. Uh, so basically, uh, lots of economists uh, suggested that we're going to go into the state of uh, basically fiscal collapse uh, and wrote books with uh, exactly <laughs> that name and the uh, uh, that word in the title. So perhaps, yeah, I know, uh, I know there's no shortage of uh, of economists warning against. Uh, they were heading for this uh, financial crisis, and uh, you know the the only solutions that if people think there is a solution, uh, some people don't, but some people think you know maybe some kind of combination of economic growth and inco- raising income taxes and uh, and various cuts. Uh, but it just doesn't. I mean, your book really lays out the the economics of that kind of approach is probably not really addressing the reality of the situation. Exactly, because uh, um, if you look at the progress in biotechnology and uh, medicine, uh, we have uh, a lot of new procedures coming on the market. And uh, with the current paradigm in healthcare, where we just don't let the patient die uh, during the last mile, so when you get into the hospital, the doctors will try to do whatever is possible to keep you alive. Um, with more people uh, heading in their senior years, uh, and we perfectly understand that uh, we get more and more diseases and uh, uh, medical problems uh, down the road, because most of the diseases out there are age-related, the healthcare part is going to get more expensive, and we can either cut or we can uh, uh, do something else. So mo- most of the economists in their books are proposing, well, one of the few alternatives. So some of them are proposing uh, major austerity measures. So that's the key word right now in Europe. So austerity, mm. austerity, austerity. Let's uh, tighten our belts and let's uh, introduce more transparency, uh, collect taxes more efficiently, uh, look at uh, 
uh, ways to redistribute wealth, so from the rich to the poor, so it's becoming more socialized. Um, and as you can see, that socialism trend is uh, increasing in even in the U.S., right? Uh, whereas uh, uh, the turn of the previous century, uh, that would have been uh, uh, considered to be, you know, communist ideas and uh, uh, cut at its roots. Uh, but at the same time, uh, you see very few solution that, solutions that may work in this current economic crisis. Uh, uh, economic uh, climate, because uh, if you cut uh, anywhere, you, you you will either hurt the retirees or you will hurt the economy. So uh, the cuts are definitely not going to do it because the waves uh, of the waves of the waves of retirees are going to be just increasing and people are going to live longer with the current uh, um, healthcare paradigm. So mm -hmm. it's very difficult to stop that wave of retirees. Uh, so the solution that I've proposed was to accelerate aging research and uh, change the retirement culture. So the tipping, well, yeah. the tipping point, back to the question, is mm -hmm. uh, yeah. very clear. I mean, it's uh, very simple maths. Uh, and it varies from country to country because uh, in some countries uh, the government provides uh, the lion's uh, share of the pension and uh, health care benefits uh, later in life, after uh, a citizen reaches a certain age, in some countries the, the citizen is responsible for uh, um, taking care of himself or herself uh, later in life. But let's say in the U.S., which is the beating heart of the world's economy, um, and where citizen, uh, citizens cover part of the healthcare expenses and uh, um, still a large percentage of the retirement income comes from savings and home equity, but even in this country, uh, the government pays, uh, if we think about just pure numbers, and uh, I might, may be off by 1,000 or 2,000 uh, uh, per category, uh, because numbers change over, over time and get, get, uh, get adjusted. But uh, just on the abstract level, in the U.S., approximately um, 13,000 uh, per person per year is spent on Social Security. Uh, then another 11,000, uh, that's Medicare. And another 6,000, that, that's for a retired um, person after uh, reaching the retirement age, which is, let's say, 65. Uh, then another 6,000, that's uh, Medicaid. So we're talking about uh, gross that's going to be over $30,000 a year. So if the person's uh, um, life after retirement is significantly longer than uh, uh, the time it took to uh, contribute to the economy, um, then we have a net loss on the uh, lifetime basis. And of course, mm -hmm. uh, the retirees do contribute to the economy, uh, but the uh, but it's a net negative contribution if you think about it, because they definitely contribute to the healthcare segment, the pharmaceutical uh, segment, but they draw more from the economy than they contribute. So it may yep. it may look positive on the GDP side if you can uh, calculate the GDP, but it's actually it increases the liabilities going forward and the increases the strain on the uh, younger population. Indeed, I, I mean in your in your book you. Uh... I mean, you make the point that, well, I guess in, in my discussion with, with uh, clients, and I actually am a retirement advisor, uh, that a lot of people don't like the idea of living longer because essentially they think that it is just a matter of science keeping them alive in ill health. And, and of course, that would also add to the costs kind of already happening. Now, in your book, I, I think you know, that the real key is we're talking – not about keeping ill people alive, but we're talking about actually preventative medicine as well as regenerative medicine. And, and, and you actually say in your book uh, uh, that you say that regenerative medicine is in a far more advanced state than most people realize. Now, can you say a little bit more about this and, you know, and where are we and how, how soon could some of these uh, uh, you know, breakthroughs actually start to have an impact? Well, regenerative medicine is definitely far more advanced than uh, most people uh, realize. And uh, the fact of the matter is that some of the procedures uh, are already in the clinic. 
is just regenerative medicine as a term is a very broad area, uh, which is com which em encompasses uh, many areas of scientific research. So, for example, blood transfusions, that's also a form of regenerative medicine, um, which went online in the uh, uh, 1930s, in late 1930s, uh, it went mainstream. But uh, think about um, hematopoietic stem cell transplantations. Uh, hematopoietic stem cells were just categorized in humans in the late 80s. And uh, right now, they're already saving lives. They are not used for pre prevention. They are not used for uh, regeneration at the moment. But uh, in um, pediatric oncohematology, for example, the center where um, I have my lab, we have uh, a, v a vast number of hematopoietic stem cell transplantations every year. Uh, bone marrow uh, transplantations are also a form of uh, regenerative medicine. And uh, right now, there are already advanced procedures where you could transplant the uh, bone marrow from a donor to a recipient and um, have very little adverse effects uh, uh, going forward. So very little immunogenic um, response. There are many procedures that are, that are currently in clinical trials or already in the clinic that, um, are that already save lives. Unfortunately, we don't use that for uh, prevention. We don't use that for uh, regenerating organs uh, to prevent uh, or to restore lost function. Uh, already there are procedures that restore eyesight using um, some of the regenerative medicine uh, techniques. Uh, some of the regenerative medicine techniques are already saving lives of patients that lost their trachea. So just a couple of years ago, Paolo Macchiarini uh, transplanted uh, the first trachea uh, into a patient uh, after a severe injury uh, where he used the extracellular matrix for, from a dead donor, from it's a cadaverous uh, um, tissue, but uh, he decellularized the matrix and recellularized it using patient's own cells. So it's an autologous uh, transplantation, so it doesn't, uh, it's not recognized by the immune system as a foreign body and does not require much um, immune suppressants during the course of treatment. Uh, and those procedures are slowly progressing into the clinic. We already see clinical trials in gene therapy um, uh, in the cardiovascular uh, diseases. We already see some clinical trials in uh, uh, stem cell therapies in cardiovascular diseases. Uh, we see organs um, built de novo uh, from the patient's own uh, cells. So in the very near future, we're probably going to see an explosion in this area. And if you think about it, the probably the most uh, rapidly advancing field of regenerative medicine lies in uh, induced pluripotent stem cells. So where um, a cell can be, any cell in the body can be brought back into uh, a stem cell-like state, well, almost any cell in the body, so uh, you would not have much luck with uh, erythrocytes or some uh, cells that uh, lost their nucleus. Um, so you would be able to bring the cell back and uh, then, de uh, then differentiate it into another stem cell state. So basically, um, you do not need embryonic stem cells anymore to produce other cell types. You can use uh, induced pluripotent stem cells. And those techniques are becoming more advanced, uh, more therapeutically viable. So I would say within the next uh, few years, we are probably going to see therapeutically viable induced pluripotent stem cells uh, producing both either stem cell uh, types and cell types to build new organs or injected and used um, uh, directly into the patient as a cell therapy. So, and if you look at how fast this industry has progressed, just in 2007, Yamanaka uh, published his first pro protocol uh, for, induced pro for generating induced pluripotent stem cells. Uh, and just last year, he got a Nobel Prize for it. So the mm -hmm. 
uh, technology has proliferated into so many labs. Even our lab has uh, a project in IPSC. Um, everybody in the regenerative medicine is thinking about uh, one or the other technique uh, in using uh, induced pluripotent stem cells or generating therapeutically viable induced pluripotent stem cells. So in the future, I would say, uh, within the next few years, uh, I have little doubt that uh, given the number of projects worldwide uh, and the amount of funding going into this, is, uh, into this area, uh, I have no doubt that we are going to see uh, uh, this industry advance. And initially, uh -huh. we're going to see treatments. So for uh, deadly um, diseases, uh, late-stage diseases, uh, that will extend uh, patient lifespans marginally and primarily on the deathbed. But hopefully later, we will see those uh, procedures uh, translating into the mainstream and acceleration of this translation into mainstream will define uh, the health of the global economy. So that's I was I was uh, going to comment that in your book, you really do spend a fair amount of time saying that while this uh, explosion is coming, it still needs uh, a change and acceleration in terms of the actual process from discovery to clinic. Can you say what kinds of things might speed that up? Well, there are lots of ideas that can be brought forward. One idea is currently we see a lot of regulatory barriers, especially in the U.S., especially in the European Union, where um, we cannot really experiment effectively with um, – some of the advances in regenerative medicine on humans, even when there is informed consent and uh, people are willing uh, to take risks to get better outcomes, uh, even if there is a, the possibility of, you know, fatality, fatal event, because they understand that the life is finite. Um, so re we, we really need to see some deregulation uh, in the delivery of some of the experimental techniques to the patient and uh, have more, well, transfer some of the power back to the patient. Because right mm -hmm. now the industry is too regulated. Even if we look at the aspirin example, uh, naturally this drug uh, uh, went into the mainstream as a um, preventative uh, drug uh, over the course of 100 years, so it's a very long time. Uh, imagine some of the stem cell procedures or regenerative medicine procedures going mainstream. It will not be possible in the current uh, regulatory environment. Uh, mm -hmm. If we look at how some of the drugs progress to market, it takes on average six years for a uh, you know hardcore cancer drug to uh, get to the market, and we're talking about very late stage. Uh, uh, very uh, um, aggressive cancer focus for uh, some of those drugs. So uh, you would expect that uh, for patients that are already on their deathbed, it would be easy to get access to some of the experimental mm. treatments. Yeah. But it's not. It uh, takes, again, uh, on average six years from uh, uh, the lab to the clinic. And for uh, some of the for, for other diseases, uh, for example, for cardiovascular diseases and for um, autoimmune diseases, for metabolic diseases, uh, this cycle is by far uh, much longer. So mm -hmm. uh, we really need to figure out a way to speed up and uh, reduce the burden of the FDA on acceleration uh, of the progression of medical technologies from the lab to the clinic. So patient's but consent should be enough in some cases. Yes, I mean, that would obviously really speed things up if you have people that uh, were uh, well informed of the risks but are willing to proceed. Uh, I can see how that would be really important. Um, I, I wonder, uh, in your book, you talk about uh, China as really committing uh, a fair amount of funds and uh, focus to uh, medicine. And can you talk about how that system differs from the U.S. and and what you expect to see there in the next five to ten years? 
Uh, well, in terms of biomedical research, China is the new promised land for uh, many scientists because of the vast amount of funding it is putting into biomedical research. Uh, to put you in the perspective, uh, in the U.S., the major funding body is the NIH, and it spends uh, somewhere in the range of uh, $30 billion, well, 30, uh, 33, $35 billion dollars. Um, on uh, biomedical research, and uh, a lion's share of that funding uh, is going into um, extramural funding. It's basically grants to uh, other organizations. It's uh, fueling uh, research not only in the U.S., but also worldwide. Uh, so think about it. Let's say $30, 30 billion, and um, the figure has been uh, steadily increasing. So if you look at uh, uh, that spending by the, by, uh, by the NIH uh, 20 years ago, it was probably a third or less. Um, so it has been steadily increasing. And uh, in uh, China, China just recently announced a program to spend uh, uh, $308 billion over the uh, course of five years on biomedical research and infrastructure. So wow. uh, that is... Uh, significantly more than the NIH over the past, uh, let's say, eight years or even 10 years. Uh, and that program went uh, live in uh, 2011. So it was announced in 2011. It's already ongoing and they're constantly planning to uh, invest more. And that was just the federal level funding. Uh, municipal governments are spending uh, enormous amount of money on uh, biomedical infrastructure. It's, it's sometimes scary. So uh, they have things like the China Medical City, where you have uh, <laughs> uh, a city the size of Baltimore, um, and it's just dedicated to medicine. Or uh, you have grant projects like the Beijing Genomics Institute. It's uh, not located in Beijing, it's located in Shenzhen. Uh, and it's currently the large, world's largest sequencing center. So about 30% or more geno genomic sequencing is done at that particular center. Well, well, it's the largest in the world. And currently they're venturing into other areas. So uh, areas that are not only the sequencing center, they also venture into diagnostics. So it's the largest prenatal diagnostics center in the world. Uh, they're uh, venturing into transgenics. So they are already designing new fishes uh, that will be resilient to pollution and uh, will grow really rapidly. And it's a very, um, it's a very noble uh, strain of fish that they're designing. I saw that with my own eyes. Huh. And uh, recently they announced a plan to build a center for uh, uh, genomics research, but it's actually, it's like for biomedical research. Uh, it's going to be 50 square kilometers uh, north of Shenzhen. And um, projects like that really blow your mind. And think about the sheer number of scientists. Uh, yes, the quality of the research was worse than the U.S. Uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, but they're catching up really rapidly because the U.S. made the uh, largest major altruistic gift to the world. Uh, they opened up uh, um, the fruits of uh, uh, biomedical research to the world. So there are no more barriers. You go to PubMed, there, that's the central repository for biomedical texts uh, run by the National Library of Medicine, uh, and you can PubMed almost any keyword in biomedicine, and you will be able to get a link to the journal, and there is a high chance that it's going to be uh, accessible, uh, either with subscription or without a subscription. So you would actually be able to um, go and learn about the study. So uh, basically, so China uh, does not need to uh, uh, repeat the experiments conducted in the U.S. because now they have uh, free access to the medical literature uh, they can read up uh, the articles on PubMed and on, uh, on journals that PubMed links to, um, get access to that knowledge and start where uh, their U.S. peers left off uh, or venture into some new direction. So this completes part one of the interview with Alex Zavarankov. 
In part two, we will discuss what policies are needed to encourage healthy behavior and also what individuals can do, including adopting an attitude of continuous learning.